From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio, WYBC, and 1490 AM, WGCH, Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. A call for radical economic reform to save the U.S. will fix America's fiscal crisis in under an hour tonight on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Lawrence Kotlikoff is the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor of Economics at Boston University, President of Economic Security Planning, Inc., a company specializing in financial planning software. Professor Kotlikoff received his B.A. of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, his Ph.D. in Economics at Harvard. He's been a senior economist with the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He is the author of 14 books, hundreds of articles, including areas such as financial reform, personal finance, taxes, social security, health care, deficits, generational accounting, pensions, saving, all the ingredients necessary to save us from our failed political class. Professor's author Jimmy Stewart is dead, ending the world's ongoing financial plague with limited-purpose banking, and you're hired, a Trump playbook for fixing America's economy. Welcome, Larry. Good to talk to you. Uh, Great great to be with you, Jim. Did you you run a write-in candidacy for president in 2016? Uh, Yeah, I was one of five people that could uh, be officially uh, elected back in 2016. It was, uh, you know, it, it... you cannot just run as a writing candidate without getting registered. So I was uh, registered around the country, took a big effort. But unfortunately, the press had no interest until the very end when they realized that they were stuck with these two candidates. And they started to call, but it was too late. Yeah. I thought maybe you got more votes than Hillary. Um, before we dump, uh, jump into uh, the fiscal crisis, what are your thoughts on the prospects of a trade war with China? Uh, well, I think we're in the middle of one already. You know, we've Got the two sides on, you know, things could turn around. They could both back down. But you've got uh, both sides putting tariffs, announcing tariffs already on $50 billion of goods on each side. And then President Trump yesterday said he was going to add tra- tariffs on another $100 billion. The Chinese, of course, will respond. And this will be a disaster for uh, the stock market and for the economy. And interest rates are going to shoot up, I'm sure. We could go into recession. I mean, this is just uh, the ex- – you know, if you have um, – legitimate concerns, you don't raise them in, in such a um, antagonistic manner. You take them to the World Trade Organization, let them make a decision that everybody agrees to, and the Chinese will. Uh, there's been certainly a lot of the discussion over the years about the Chinese stealing our intellectual property. Well, yeah. it seems like our government should do things uh, to, to get it, help our country. Our companies protect their intellectual property. We may be stealing Chinese intellectual property. I'm sure the Chinese are claiming that. So it would be good to have an independent forum really explore uh, who's telling the truth here. Uh, it's not like our government always tells the truth about everything. I'm old enough to remember Nixon, Vietnam, <laughs> LBJ, uh, resolution, LBJ. Yes, you know Pentagon Papers, and and certainly Donald Trump uh, has uh, great difficulty with. Uh, Connecting to the truth, it's it's hard, you know. <laughs> I just hope. He's, given, given to, yeah. I just hope. I just hope he's bluffing to get a better deal. Well, let me uh, let's well, try. Let's, um, yeah, let's, you know, it could be. You know, I have no idea what he's saying. He's like a random variable, and um, I don't know that he knows what he's saying. But you can't play these kinds of games in the international forum. People at some point take you seriously, and the markets do, and people lose money on their retirements. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah, and for, a former ambassador. Yeah, this is a, a former yeah, ambassador right. told me that. Um, that, you know, playing around with Mexico isn't smart as well because they may elect uh, in their cu- upcoming election a, a guy who's very hostile to the U.S. So this stuff tends to boomerang. Let's jump into our problems. The country's I'm going to read I'm going to read something that you wrote. The country's broke. Our economic institutions are dysfunctional. The middle class is vanishing. We're saving and investing next to nothing. We are locking the poor into poverty. We're undereducating our children. Jobs, especially well-paid jobs, are hard to find. We're growing ever more unequal. We're increasingly pointing a finger at one another. I want to ask you, uh, Ed, you, you have stats in here that are scary. Wages, to average take-home pay in constant dollars is actually slightly lower than 1966, which you can start to see why Trump got elected. Is, is the American dream dying? And tell people what the fiscal gap is, the unfunded liabilities that nobody even really understands. Yeah, I would say the American dream at this point is dead, and I don't think Trump's doing anything to fix it, to the truth. I think he's making he's not making America greater, he's making America worse. On, on balance, I think the tax reform he passed that uh, he signed 
was better than nothing and will do some good mm -hmm. to the economy. But the basic problem that with this with the fiscal on the fiscal side, we have so many problems. But on the fiscal side, we have um, all these off the book liabilities to yeah. pay for your, you know, Jim, you're, you're a little bit older uh, than, you know, 15 or so. You're probably getting close to getting Social Security mm -hmm. and Medicare. Uh, those are big dollar buck uh, benefits that you're going to be receiving. Me too. I'm 67. So the whole baby boom generation, about 78 million of us are going to be collecting these benefits. Many of us are, are already for the rest of our lives. That's a big debt that's not on the books. So there's all these off the book liabilities. When you add them all up and you, you know, in other words, when you do the fiscal uh, accounting correctly to figure out all the outlays that uh, the government's going to be doing, doing in the future, you take the present value of those and subtract the present value of all the future receipts of taxes and other receipts, no matter what you call things. In other words, you put everything on the books, you get a fiscal gap of $200 trillion. Now, the official debt we're reporting is $20 trillion. So people are being told another lie here by right. the U.S. government about our fiscal situation. It's 10 times worse than we're being told. Okay, I want to start looking at some of these proposals you call them economic magic. Uh, you said the tax cuts were better than nothing. You have tax reform ideas that are pretty radical, no corporate in tax, personal uh, income tax, personal income. Tell us uh, the shape of yeah. tax reform that you have in your mind. Well, let me be clear. I don't think that the, uh, the, the, the restructuring of the corporate tax, having a lower uh, effective marginal tax on, on investing in the U.S., is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think having tax cuts when you've got a two hundred trillion dollar fiscal gap uh, is a good thing, unless you want, unless you hate your children and grandchildren. <laughs> so we needed to have uh, a tax reform that not only increased the incentive for companies to invest here and stay here, but we also and lowered the marginal tax on, especially on poor people for working, which in many cases could be eighty, ninety percent. For so many people, because we have so many inter interconnected fiscal policies that tax you on working, you can lose benefits if you earn extra money, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but so what I was uh, proposing in this book, um, you're hired a Trump uh, playbook for a gu guidebook to uh, fixing America's economy, which is a free book that can be downloaded at kotlikoff.net, uh, is a uh, combination of uh, different taxes than we now have. I would get rid of the of the federal personal income tax entirely. I would get rid of the um, uh, state and gift tax. I would replace these with um, a value-added tax. Uh, I would take the, the payroll tax and uh, not tax people with low earnings under the payroll tax, but uh, eliminate the ceiling on the payroll tax. I'd also have a progressive add-on, a progressive personal consumption tax, a carbon tax, and then a tax on the inheritance. And you would have, and the way this is designed, uh, and it was designed with a lot of con con uh, consultation with other top, with other, I don't want to call myself top, but other public finance economists with people who work, that I do consider to be top public finance economists, uh, about how to do this. Uh, I leave everybody under this proposal facing a 30% marginal tax on earning money. So it's a highly progressive, much more progressive, fiscal a tax system that, that we now have it gets i also get rid of the corporate income tax entirely so we become the lowest tax country in the world to invest in and uh the rich pay start paying their fair share of taxes because of this personal consumption tax and we also eliminate the ceiling on the fica on the payroll tax it's like a social security tax so there are much better tax reforms than what we just passed, I, I, give, I give that one a B minus. I give the one I'm proposing an A plus, and again, it was not just uh, my idea, it's the combination of a lot of people's ideas that I you know, brought together and then I discussed with them to make sure they were happy with it, with this plan. And we're going to go into more detail. Um, the, this, this also, these, these plans not only will help grow the economy and um, help the, the lower income and make the taxes progressive at the top, but it should take a big gap out of that $206 trillion unfunded liability uh, uh, debt, right? Yeah, we would get more revenue. I, there's also uh, reforms. Uh, very, these, each of these reforms is, can be put on a, on a postcard, whether, you know, my plans for fixing Social Security, for health care, the banking system, uh, taxes, education, uh, immigration, all these things are postcard solutions, because I don't think 
uh, you need to, if you start presenting highly complicated solutions to the public, their eyes are going to glaze over for good reason, nor are they necessary. If you can't keep it simple, it's not a good plan. I mean, it has to be something people can understand, and it makes perfect sense. So the tax reform would be part of um, one one step in reducing the fiscal gap to zero Social Security reform I'm proposing, the health care reform I'm proposing, those things, those three things together would eliminate the fiscal gap entirely. Wow, that's and pretty impressive. Right. Business Talk with Jim Campbell on the Business Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. Go to biztalkradio.com. We'll be back in our next segment with more of this economic magic. Back with BU Professor of Economics, Lawrence Kotlikoff. Uh, Larry, I want to focus on income inequality a little bit first, because you do a lot on that, um, both at that tax rate, abolishing the poverty trap. Talk talk about a little, you, you have a proposal on food stamps. It's pretty creative stuff. Um, talk a little bit about how you would tackle income inequality, which is becoming a huge problem. Yeah, it's a huge problem. I think the problem is somewhat smaller than people are suggesting because they're not taking into account the fact that the fiscal system is redis- is very progressive in our country. So there are papers on my website, kotlikoff.net, which I've written recently with Alan Auerbach that provide a more uh, appropriate measure of our progressivity. I'll just give you an example, Jim. If you look at the, uh, at 40-year-olds and you look at the richest 1%, uh, they, um, uh, they own a 20 uh, Five percent or so of the wealth of the net wealth, you know, financial assets and real assets like homes and so forth. But they only get to do about thirteen percent of the consumption. So, roughly speaking, uh, uh, the fiscal system, in combination with more uh, with earnings, labor income, which is more equally distributed than than wealth, uh, these two things combine to make inequality roughly half of what you would expect if you just looked at what you would think if you just looked at wealth inequality. But uh, having the 1% of the people get to consume 13% of the resources of a cohort is still extremely unequal. You know, all you have to do is take a look at President Trump's yacht or his Marco Lago uh, estate <laughs> and the lifestyle that he leads. You know, this is um, a Richie Rich, uh, <laughs> and it's not the American dream for the public. So we need to take steps to to get to, to equality, and and we could try and just redistribute from people like Trump and give to the poor, but uh, that's going to have you know going to produce very bad work incentive, uh, incentives or disincentives. So what we need to do is come up with ways to uh, to raise the uh, earnings potential, uh, earnings of of uh, middle class and poor people, and the way to do that, I think the most important way is. Well, first of all, we need to stop locking them into poverty. So we need a tax reform that uh, that rationalize the tax system. Sorry about the background noise here Sorry. on a train, but the, um, uh, the the tax reform I'm talking about here would uh, give all Americans a 30 percent marginal tax rate, so that everybody would have an incentive to to work. Uh, we have a lot of poor people right now. You know, when I say a lot. Uh, over half uh, who are locked into poverty because of very, very, very high marginal tax rates on working. So you need a, a reform of the fiscal system that that uh, gives them the right incentive to work. But, but more importantly, we need to fix the educational system, yeah. and we need to do it in a way that equalizes education and gets class size down to to one one to really a classrooms of one. And how can you do that? Well, actually, it's not that hard given modern online education. What we, we should do in every school in the, in the country, and the federal government should pay for this, is to provide pods where each child is sitting in front of a, in a an enclosure uh, with headphones, looking at a screen and spending maybe um, four hours a day getting the same online education as every other kid in the country, uh, to the extent that the school system and the teachers uh, opt to, to use that um, uh, that educational modality. We, I'm not talking about forcing anything on anybody, but we want to give uh, everybody in the, in the country an equal education, and we, we can't necessarily afford to get the best teachers in every school because there aren't that many great teachers around the country. But they can all, but a single great teacher can deliver a um, same online course, uh, video and, and other online uh, um, 
uh, you know, testing and, and uh, that can all be delivered to uh, a seventh grader uh, throughout the country, no matter where they're living. And by having kids in a pod with headphones, the kids are not going to be disrupted by other kids in the class. This is one of the major problems with our ed- education uh, system, our primary education and secondary education system. You've got very, uh, you know, in some, many classrooms, uh, a lot of disruptive children who are preventing other kids from learning. They're preventing, preventing themselves from learning. So this is one way to leverage technology. I believe it's being used in New York, in, uh, in the Bronx, in uh, some experimental programs, but I can't see that it can, can hurt or be that expensive uh, to implement something we need to try. We have to break out from under this uh, system that we now have, which is basically failing our kids. Uh, you know, if we look at the ranking of the U.S. in terms of educational achievement of our children, we're, um, you know, we're way down in the list of countries, you know, maybe 30th, 20th, it's just not uh, where we used to be when you and I were kids. Now, let me ask you uh, this. The, uh, you talk about replacing tax credits with the negative income tax. I interviewed a guy, the CEO of tech, who's going to run for president in 2020. And he, there's a McKinsey study that says 45% of jobs are going to be automated. He has a vision of a universal basic income uh, given to everybody for, of $12,000. So it, it puts a floor on them without enough that would be a disincentive. Uh, talk about that and your negative income tax. How do you see that area to help the middle, to help the poor, actually? Well, the question is what tax rates would uh, be required to produce that kind of um, redistribution. Uh, and I'm currently in the process of studying that together with Alan Auerbach, who's uh, an economist at Berkeley. Uh, my concern is that the marginal tax rates are going to be uh, really high and that, uh, you know, we, we $12,000 uh, may sound like a lot, but it's not going to be enough for many very poor people that don't, they need more than that to get through the year. Mm-hmm. If they're disabled, you know, um, they're going to need health care as well as – think about somebody who's disabled. They get about that amount of money right now under disability, but they also get Medicare. So that might be another – might be closer to 20000 or $25,000 of support they're getting. So and then you have uh, millions of people that aren't, are not receiving re- support on – so uh, – this is um, potentially very expensive in terms of the level of the marginal tax rate that, or the tax rates that we'd have to to impose to pay for it. Uh, I'm proposing something uh, that I think would uh, produce much more equality, uh, certainly uh, on the fiscal side, and, and get the marginal tax rates to 30 percent for everybody having a progressive consumption tax, having a, uh, uh, a uh, progressive, more progressive payroll tax than we now have, getting rid of the ceiling. There, there are ways we can um, and a VAT. get to much more progressivity Let me ask value you, at a tax. Let's move on now to, to infrastructure. Uh, you say there's, to go from a D-plus to an A, it would require a $3.6 trillion investment, which, by the way, happens to be close to the Iraq-Afghan war investments. Uh, how do we fix infrastructure? Well, we need to realize that um, we have to make some investments in education and infrastructure uh, that other countries are making, new technology, but Internet uh, connectivity for throughout the country, which still is not where it should be, uh, in order to uh, get the revenues in the future to be higher, our economy to be producing more. And the, how much uh, infrastructure we really need is, it's an open question, and the engineers have kind of a vested interest in making things look bad, so they may be overstating the need for for more infrastructure. But we know that uh, we know that uh, we're having bridges uh, collapse in different parts of the country, right? So we know just from uh, uh, observation that we've got big problems, and I don't see uh, you know Congress. The fact that Congress is not able to pass an infrastructure bill a year and some into the Trump presidency is indicative of the fact that the country's broke. Good point. We'll be fixing health care and Social Security in our third place.
Hey, we're back with Larry Kotlikoff. You're hired a Trump playbook for fixing America's co- economy. He's got a whole playbook literally in there. And now Mission Impossible is health care. Um, you have what you call this purple health care reform, eliminates Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare, and employer subsidies. How are you going to do all that? Well, you start from scratch. You say, look, we don't need to have a balkanized health care system. It's still leaving 30 million people uninsured. And if the president and uh, the Republican Party have their way, and by the way, I'm not a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I ran, uh, as as you mentioned uh, in one of the segments, but I ran as a uh, write-in candidate against both Clinton and and Trump. So, uh, you know, curse on both of their houses is my view. But we, 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 need to ha- we need to rationalize the health care system, but I think we, we still need to make it a competitive private provider system. We, we, but it doesn't need to be paid for. Uh, uh, it, we can have a single payer, namely Uncle Sam, uh, and uh, still have uh, competition. And the, uh, you know, ultimately, if Uncle Sam pays, we're paying. So this whole notion of uh, single payer. Uh, is a little bit vague. I think the the uh, if you look at, for example, the the British system, they've got the government owning the hospitals, hiring the doctors, micromanaging everything. That's the real question. Uh, that's what Bernie Sanders would like to have a government-run healthcare system. As I understand it, I may be misstating what Bernie has in mind. I may be overstating it. Uh, but what I have in mind is uh, an is Medicare for all, but not medic, not not traditional Medicare for all, but Medicare Part C for all. So that's the Republican part of Medicare. The Republicans set up Medicare Part C for all. About 30 percent of Medicare participants are in Medicare Part C, and what it is is that you get a, uh, in effect, you get a voucher based on your pre-existing condition. So if you're sick, you get a big voucher. You take it to a health insurance HMO, health insurance company like Kaiser or Cleveland Clinic or whatever. And uh, partners in Boston, and you uh, you sign up for a year uh, with that company. They get the the amount of money that's on the voucher from the government, and you get covered for the, what's covered by under that voucher. So I'm saying everybody in the country should get a voucher each year. You, Jim, if you're healthy, you get a small voucher. If you're sick, you get a big voucher based on your expected health care costs under the uh, basic plan. Mm-hmm. So the government defines what's covered. You get a voucher. Everybody else gets a voucher. We all choose an insurance company. The cost of all these vouchers is paid by Uncle Sam. They add up to uh, 13% of GDP. And uh, through time, the government keeps those vouchers, sets sets what's covered, such that the cost of these vouchers never exceeds 13% of GDP of our country's output, so that we don't have that number go from 13 to 20%, which is a large part of our long-term fiscal insolvency problem that health care expenditures as our country ages and as health care uh, costs continue to rise faster than other costs uh, that our country goes broke you know, or that actually our kids go broke and actually leave the country because they can't survive here. Uh, so we need to uh, give everybody health insurance, uh, but we cannot continue to do it uh, to do it through four failed programs. I'll, I'll Larry, healthcare and all these, yeah, Larry, let me ask you if you if you freeze it at thirteen percent of GDP, which obviously does help fix that. Uh, in fact, your plan reduces the fiscal gap by sixty percent. You say, how do you avoid rationing? Well, just the healthcare plan part would would reduce it dramatically. Uh, my my all my plans eliminate the fiscal gap entirely. How do we avoid rationing? Well, it is kind of a form of rationing because the government says we're going to cover X, Y, and Z, but we're not going to cover. A, B, and, you know, we're not going to cover angioplasty at 99. Uh, we're not going to cover, <laughs> uh, you know, plastic surgery. There are things we're not going to cover for you, and you can get supplemental insurance if you can afford it. So we're always going to have some two-tier medicine here. But the basics, everybody should have a basic policy. And, you know, ultimately, uh, people are getting covered. If somebody uh, breaks their arm and has no health insurance in our country, uh They'll typically be taken to some emergency room, and they will get that arm repaired. But they're also going to get onto their credit card uh, a huge bill, and that can put them into uh, bankruptcy. So we should not have 30 million people walking around, or 20 million people right now today, walking around with a prospect of going bankrupt if they get hit by a car, and the guy runs off, and they they don't have any way of 
paying for the the treatment. <laughs> All it's right, one more one more question on one more question on healthcare before we go to social security. What are you going to do about malpract- yeah. malpractice costs? Well, so part of the Purple Health uh, plan, and everybody can go to Purple Health, uh, Purple sorry, PurplePlans.org to see these plans. Purple Plans, so it's www.purplePlans.org. PurplePlans.org. Uh, one of the provisions, and it's just a postcard length solution. Uh, I think the last provision is um, is to uh, eliminate um, excessive uh, malpractice uh, settlements. So we need to have malpractice reform so that we don't have doctors and HMOs practicing defensive medicine. We, our system, our country can't afford it. We cannot have unreasonable uh, judgments. We have to, uh, you know, obviously we need to let people through doctors that are really egregious, but we cannot let the, you know, people get outrageous thumbs um it's just too expensive for the system as a whole. So we need to have malpractice reform. Okay, fixing Social Security. Now there's a $26 trillion fiscal gap there. You have some creative solutions, including f- fixing the savings problem while we're uh, fixing Social Security. So go ahead and tell us about it. Yeah, the current uh, fiscal gap just in Social Security, if you look at the present value of all the projected outlays uh, and subtract the present value of all the receipts and you incorporate the trust fund, uh, it's 34 trillion dollars that's in the trustees report table 6f1 roman 6f1 <laughs> 2000 and 2017 uh trustees report the politicians running that who are the who call themselves trustees uh hit that uh table at the very end of the report in the appendix <laughs> but that's the most important thing in the report it shows the system is 32 percent under finance uh in comparison the detroit pensions were 20 percent under finance when they drove Detroit into bankruptcy. So Social Security is in dire, dire, dire straits, and the rest of the fiscal system cannot bail them out, bail it out because it's even in an even worse shape. Uh, the entire fiscal system is 52% under finance, uh, 50, yeah, not that, 52%. So how do you fix Social Security? Well, what I would do is freeze the existing system, pay up all the benefits that are owed under the, up till now, that have been accrued up till now, to current retirees and to workers, uh, we pay off the workers as they reach retirement age that they would receive benefits based on their earnings records up to this date, but they'd have zeros filled into their earnings records thereafter. So we just shut down the system at the margin, but we pay what we owed. So the system would not accrue any additional liabilities. And then, and I'm talking about the retirement portion of the system, not the disability portion or the uh, survivor portion uh, well, we'd have to think about how to reform those as well. But the um, but in the replacing replacing the retirement uh, saving system at the margin, I would have every American worker contribute 10 percent of their pay uh, to a personalized uh, security account system. Half of that money would go into the account of the spouse if you have a, a spouse. So there's a contribution sharing. The government would make matching contributions on behalf of the poor and the unemployed and the uh, disabled. And then you would have uh, all those monies, all those contributions invested in a global market-weighted index of stocks, bonds, and real estate. So everybody's getting the same rate of return, and it's all being managed by computer, and nobody on Wall Street gets a penny. Uh, and then the government would also guarantee that as you're, if you reach, when you reach retirement age, if your account balance did, did not equal what you put in adjusted for inflation, the government would make up the difference. So the government would guarantee a zero real return on your investment. Uh, and then your your money and everybody else in your age group and your co- birth cohort, uh, your account balances at starting around 57 would be gradually sold off over 10 years, and, tra- and the money would be used to buy inflation index bonds from the government, and those inflation index bonds would then be used to pay Pensions to the you and you and other people in your birth birth cohort in proportion to your account balance. So if you had twice as much money in your um, personalized uh, personal uh, security account, you would get twice the uh, the pension benefit that comes out to you in old old age. It would continue till the end of your life, and it would be indexed for inflation. That's a very simple reform. You know, if you look at it, we have a huge trust fund that was invested all over the world at zero cost to the American public. 
Now, if you look at countries like Norway and Singapore, that's exactly what they're doing. They have uh, massive uh, trust funds to pay for pensions for their for the workers that are invested globally, and they're basically done at extremely low cost because trying to beat the market is not something that uh, yeah. <clears throat> we can uh, really hope to do on a systematic basis for everybody. And so we have we have uh, no fees to Wall Street and balances accrue to heirs. It's a, it's an amazing looking thing. You listen to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Our final national segment. We're going to fix Wall Street and the banks. Back for our final national segment, Larry Kotlikoff calling for a lot of radical economic reforms. He's an idea machine. In fact, we're going to fix um, Wall Street now. You don't, you don't think Donald Frank has been questionable about whether it's been successful, whether it's just added more regulation, uh, uh, slowing the banks. So what is limited purpose banking? Uh, limited purpose banking uh, uh, recognizes that the two main problems with, the, uh, with our banking system, which led to our financial collapsed in 2008 and have led to one financial crisis after another uh, going back to the origins of our country and going you know looking internationally is uh, leverage the fact that the banks uh, are finance these financial middlemen are borrowing money and promising to pay it back for sure but then investing it at risk so that's what I call leverage and that's what um, you know it's a common term but then they're also investing in a very opaque way so that uh, there's a there's opacity that nobody knows what they're doing with, with your money. So President Roosevelt referred to this as gambling with other people's money. That's what the banks are doing. So what I want to do is uh, eliminate the ability of middlemen to uh, engage in um, – they would have to run their operations as equity finance mutual funds. So if you look at the financial system – about 30% of the financial system right now is in equity, like our 401k case. If you think about it, if you have a 401k, let's say with equity owner, you have shares of equity of stock in that mutual fund. Fidelity, some of your money, they've handed you back stock, then they invested at risk in the stock market. That's an equity-based financial institution. And None of the um, equity finance uh, mutual funds uh, had any trouble in the 2008 financial crisis. So that part of the financial system, which uh, is, you know, connecting uh, people that have money with people that need money uh, and companies that need money, uh, that part of the financial system that got into no trouble whatsoever. So all we have to do is realize that uh, we have a model for how to keep the financial system safe, which is to make the middlemen – who are running the financial highway, they're running like a public good, the market, the financial marketplace, we, we have to keep them from gambling with this marketplace. And the way you do that is just force them to uh, take in money on an equity basis, not a, uh, a, le- uh, a debt basis, and then invest, whether they're investing in mortgages, whether they're making mortgages, whether they're investing in small business loans or large uh, corporate bonds. Uh, we have 10,000 different Mutual funds are ready today that are equity financed. They're investing in all kinds of things, uh, stocks in different, different countries. So we have something right in front of our eyes that's working. It's perfectly safe, trouble whatsoever in the 2008 now you All right. And we would checking accounts would, would be cash mutual funds on reserve with the Fed. What would we do with derivatives quickly? Yeah. Der- derivatives you would run as equity financed um, our mutual funds. Going to the racetrack, you can bet on horse A or horse B. That's a mutual fund. Some people bet on A, some people bet on B. They, they get shares or, or tickets for uh, claims on on that money. And whichever horse wins, the people who bet on that horse get the money. Now, the horse A can be IBM shares drop 30% by the end of the year compared to where they are now. Mm-hmm. That's an option. Yeah. Uh, horse B is that they don't. So we can... Run op- the option markets, the derivative markets, the CDS market. All these markets can be run 
uh, just like a uh, racetrack that that's been going on since 1837, uh, paramutual betting, without the government having to bail out any racetrack, as far as I know. And in fact, uh, that's what all that stuff is gambling anyway. Now you're you, you're going to replace the regulators with the federal financial authority. What's that? Yeah. By the way, just to say, I, I don't really view uh, investing in these things as, as gambling. I view this as risk sharing, but it has to be a risk sharing among the risk sharing parties, not where some outside party like the taxpayer takes the hit. Uh, the uh, federal financial authority would be an or, uh, a single government agency that would verify and disclose all the assets that the mutual funds are um, holding so that people know what they're buying. If I invest in a mutual fund, I should have real-time information on the mortgages. Let's say it's a mortgage mutual fund or a mutual fund that takes my money, hands me back shares, invests in your mortgage. I should be able to know uh, without disclosing your name that you that I'm investing in a mortgage in this part of uh, wherever you live. Maybe it's Connecticut, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, you've got this job, or you're got maybe not. I, I don't need to identify you. We're not talking about uh, invading your privacy, but I have an ownership of, of an asset here indirectly, which I should know about. I should know about any change in your credit rating, any change in your job status, any change in the value of your house. And the federal financial authority would be providing real-time disclosure of all this stuff. And it's not, you know, all that is really happening already through companies like, uh, you know, every every mortgage that's being made in the country, somebody is verifying it and then disclosing it to some degree. So it's not like this is an extra cost in society. It's just that it needs to be done. Uh, it's public information. It needs to be provided by a credible source. And that's all. the only credible source here is the federal government. We cannot cannot rely on Angela Mazzillo, who ran Countrywide Financial and ran it into the ground, to tell us about, uh, uh, you know, the credit, about the, to disclose mortgages, because we, we know that he and others like him uh, lied on a systematic basis. That's why we have the notion of liar loans and Murdoch loans and ninja loans, and that led to, um, to lack of confidence in, when that came out, lack of confidence in the financial system, everything became suspect, and everything melt down, melted down. So we need to have a system that cannot melt down because there's no leverage, and we have to have full disclosure in real time, and then we'll have a financial system that never collapses ever again. Well, we've had a lot of brilliant stuff in an hour. We did fix the uh, fiscal gap and sa- save the country. Uh, unfortunately, uh, simplicity and common sense is in short supply in Washington, so... I don't know how long it'll take to get this done or whether we need a complete <laughs> crisis. Thanks to Larry Kotlikoff for doing the interview. Uh, the, his book, again, Jimmy Stewart's Dead, Ending the World's Ongoing Financial Play with Limited Purpose Banking, and the free uh, booklet, You're Hired, a Trump Playbook for Fixing America's Economy. You can go to kotlikoff.net, and there's also uh, all the different plans, the healthcareplan.org, the purplefinancialplan.org, but kotlikoff.net will get you access to everything. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. You can get our podcast at iTunes. And we have a uh, YouTube version of the show as well. You can search Biz Talk with Jim Campbell. Our next show from the Council of Foreign Relations, Dr. Alyssa Ayers from the Rise of India. Thanks to Professor Lawrence Kotlikoff. Thanks to our national audience for listening to everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. And welcome now to our segment five, which is overtime. It's exclusively for Yale Radio. The Republican Freedom Caucus in Congress derailing the repeal and replace of Obamacare. We'll learn about what the Freedom Caucus is all about. And we're going to be joined by a congressman from the Freedom Caucus who's taking on Washington from the inside, seeking to drain the swamp. All of that today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Congressman Ken Buck, Republican of Colorado, Serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the Committee on Rules. He worked his way through high school, college, and law school as a janitor, truck driver, furniture mover, and ranch hand. After law school, Ken worked for Dick Cheney on the Iran-Contra investigation and then became a prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice, also serving as a district attorney in Colorado, also a business executive for a construction firm. His new book attacks business as usual in Washington, even attacking GOP business as usual. 
That book, The Drain the Swamp, How Washington Corruption is Worse Than You Think. Welcome, Congressman. Honored to have you. Thank you. It's great being with you. That's uh, it's quite, The book is a gutsy indictment of Washington, particularly for someone who's now an insider. Let me just ask you, uh, first, um, the Freedom Caucus was instrumental in uh, blocking of the uh, Obamacare repeal uh, and replacing. You know, there's some folks that feel that the Freedom Caucus is too rigid. You know, they'll drive the bus right off the cliff. President Reagan might have said, get me 80 percent and I'll come back for more. Is that a misperception about the Freedom Caucus? It absolutely is. I have to tell you, the bus is going off the cliff. And if we don't slam the brakes on right now, uh, we're, we're over the cliff. And so uh, with $20 trillion of debt, it's, it's uh, hardly the Freedom Caucus's fault that, that we are in the position that we're in. But I, I think that uh, the, the Freedom Caucus is very clear that uh, we are all in favor of responsible programs, but we cannot have the federal government uh, continue to run health care in America. The um, the bill itself, which uh, the estimates were 24 million people would uh, lose their health care or choose not to have it and might shred the safety net um, and cap Medicare spending. Was it was it a bad bill uh, in and of itself that way or was did it not go far enough in your in your in your view? I think uh, we're going to see a, a, an improved bill uh, that comes to the floor. The the, the uh, the key from my perspective is that we return as much authority to the states to regulate the system. Mm-hmm. Each state in, in America is different, has different needs, um, and, and is uh, able to spend a different uh, percentage of its budget on health care. And, and I think it's important that uh, the federal government get out of the way and allow states to make that determination. Some states will want a work requirement for Medicaid, and other states won't. And, and that's really up to the state to make that decision. Uh, but the state's going to have to balance the needs of transportation and, and K through 12 education and health care and, and others before they are, are able to make that determination. I think that the mistake we make is uh, the, the one size fits all plan from Washington, D.C. just doesn't fit everybody. Um, you said in the book, which I thought was a great point, that you wanted to see open debate on this, um, which there wasn't when Obamacare was jammed through the system. But then it ended up seeming like uh, Speaker Ryan did exactly that. Are you critical of that? I, I think that uh, there's a misperception that this bill is the only health care debate that's going to occur. Mm-hmm. This is really the first step. And we will see uh, a, a second step that, that the administration, the, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tom Price, will go through. Uh, and I think we'll see uh, other bills and other debates and, and uh, various uh, oversight hearings uh, on health care. So I, I think there will be more of an open process than we've seen so far. But because there will be no Democrat support for this bill in the House or Senate, we have to use budget reconciliation. And it's a very mm-hmm. uh, a limiting uh, way to, to try to pass legislation. Okay. So hopefully tort reform, negotiating drug prices, crossing state lines, health savings accounts, all of that stuff will get addressed at some point. Um, now you talk about this, uh, this uh, corruption being worse than we think. Tell us exactly what you mean. Well, one of the things that I uh, found when I first got to Congress was that there are dues for committees. So if you want to be on an A committee like the Appropriations Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, the um, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, there are there's uh, $450,000 of dues that you have to pay to the National Republican Congressional Committee, and the Democrats have the same uh, structure on, on their side. So uh, what happens is members oftentimes will hold receptions in Washington, D.C., invite lobbyists. Those lobbyists will uh, write a check to the National Republican Congressional Committee, and then the member owes the lobbyists. The, there is a, a corrupting influence in that whole process. If you want to be a chairman, uh, one of those committees, it costs $1.2 million. So it is, it is really a, uh, a pay-for-play system that I think uh, uh, would we it, one, it's bad optics, two, it's bad uh, politics, and three, it's bad policy. I think we, uh, we should change that. So I've written a letter to the Ethics Committee asking them to uh, make it unethical for anyone to consider uh, fundraising in the uh, promotion to an A committee or to chairman. I think that's a, that's a, that stuff's done me. I knew I knew nothing about it. How about one third of discretionary funding is unauthorized? What do you mean by that? 
what I mean is, uh, and I, I use the example in the book of the Endangered Species Act. We have a uh, an act that was passed in 1973. It had a five-year sunset on it. If, if Congress did nothing else, the, the act would uh, expire after five years. So members voted for it thinking, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. And if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, uh, it'll expire. won't require another vote. It was reauthorized once uh, with another uh, five-year sunset and uh, has not been reauthorized since. So since 1984, the Endangered Species Act has not been reauthorized. It has received appropriations every single year. It has received funding every single year. So uh, one-third, $500 billion of our discretionary budget is, uh, is unauthorized, uh, programs that should have sunset. Uh, some of them are good programs. Some of them are absolutely necessary. But if Congress doesn't do its oversight, uh, and and uh, make sure that the programs are effective and efficient, then we have uh, we have failed. And and uh, I think that's uh, it would be a good policy just to say, uh, do your oversight, or these programs don't get appropriations. In fact, the whole budgeting process, as you describe it, is kind of phony. These omnibus bills bypass essentially any oversight in the subcommittees, and the thing called the chairman's mark allows them basically to do to, to control what the budget is. There's 500 billion of user fees and fines that nobody knows where they go or anything. Um, talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, the uh, the last point that you make, I think, is a, a great point. Uh, when you go to a national park and and you pay. Uh, a fee to uh, enter the national park, that fee doesn't necessarily go to the U.S. Treasury. Oftentimes, these fees and fines that uh, agencies impose on, on private business, businesses and citizens uh, will go into uh, an agency account, and the agency then uses that money as it deems appropriate, and, and it doesn't have any oversight by Congress. Congress is supposed to, under the Constitution, have the power of the purse, if agencies are bypassing Congress by creating these separate accounts, then uh, Congress uh, has no authority over that agency. Um, talking about uh, lack of oversight, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, Congress has no control over its purse strings, and it is tended to go after big targets that can pay big fines as opposed to maybe who's behaving the worst. Do you have any uh, uh, comments on the CFPB? Yeah, I do. I, I think it needs to be reformed. Um, we, we certainly want to have uh, uh, a financial watchdog in uh, the federal government and in state governments, uh, but we don't want to have an out-of-control financial watchdog, and that's what the CFPB has become. The, uh, the funding source is the Fed, and uh, the, uh, there is no oversight. The uh, president um, uh, appoints, but Congress doesn't confirm the uh, director of the CFPB. So it, it really is a, a challenge to figure out how uh, to, to bring that agency under control without the 60 votes in the Senate. But but it's an absolutely necessary uh, uh, step uh, to, to, to have more control over any agency in, in government. We've got about a minute to go in this segment. Uh, is the XM, XM Bank an example of crony capitalism that's supposed to be benefiting small business but really benefiting actually even a very few number of big businesses? It, it absolutely is. The, the XM Bank is uh, benefiting uh, Boeing and General Electric and Caterpillar and a few large corporations, but uh, it advertises itself as, as helping uh, small business. But, uh, it, you know, the taxpayers are on the line, uh, just like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, if, if the uh, if the loans go bad, uh, the taxpayers have to pay, and, and that's that's a serious problem, and it's a problem uh, we, we, we have to deal with and, and deal with it quickly. We're back with former OIRA administrator, regulatory czar Susan Dudley, now a professor at George Washington University. And, and I read or Trump has claimed that within his first 100 days, his regulatory reform has already produced $18 billion dollars of savings. I don't know how you feel about that, but tell us how serious uh, about regulatory reform he is and, and start off with, I guess, uh, after that with the one and two out, what that means. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, um, I've been studying regulation for a long time, and this presidential cycle, there has been more discussion of regulatory reform than I think I'd ever heard before. Um, and President Trump in particular campaigned on on cutting regulations. He made some quite dramatic claims about how much he would cut it. Um, 
anywhere between 75% and 90% of, of regulations. Wow. <laughs> what, um, what he has done in his first 100 days, and I can maybe just divide it into two categories. One is working with Congress, he has overturned 13 regulations that were issued at the end of President Obama's administration. Um, using a, a, a statute that had was passed in 1996 um, and only used once before. So, and we can talk about that more if you're interested. That's the Congressional Review Act. And then um, the second thing he's done is through executive orders, he has directed agencies to um, to offset the cost of new regulations by looking at old regulations and removing them. So he his executive order requires agencies to eliminate two regulations for every new one they issue and to make sure that the total cost of those new regulations is no more than the total cost of the regulations that are getting removed. So essentially he's capping increases in regulatory costs? That's right. And Which is a pretty big deal. It is, it is a big deal. I actually think it is the most dramatic change in regulatory process since Ronald Reagan required agencies to submit regulations before they were issued to OIRA. Let me ask you this. Do, does OIRA review executive orders, and would the immigration um, executive order have, have gone through OIRA, or should it have gone through for vetting? OIRA does not review executive orders, okay. um, ex- unless it's an executive order that is, is regulatory in nature. So I'm sure that they had a chance to look at, at these two regulatory Oh, I could, at, at his regulatory executive orders, but they would not have reviewed that They would not have one. seen that. Okay. The, um, I guess Trump is also calling for regulatory reform officers and regulatory reform task forces. What does that mean? Yes, that's the second kind of cross-cutting executive order that he issued. Um, so in every agency, he's required somebody to be designated as the regulatory reform officer and a task force of other agency staff that would be the regulatory reform task force. Um, this, I think, is interesting, and it seems more important to me than I thought when I initially saw it, in that agencies agencies are filled, you know, agencies have their mission, which is to find problems to address through regulation. So everyone in the agency is focused on finding the next, um, developing the next regulation. For the first time, there's going to be a group that is designated that is responsible for looking at existing regulations, seeing if they actually work, and finding which ones might be modified or eliminated. I find it interesting that President Trump, of course, is making all these claims for progress, but here's an area where it seems very significant that is getting no no press even from him. <laughs> Who is going to head OIRA, right? Because there's not a head in there right now, is there? There's not. Uh, well, there's there's an acting person, and the career staff at OIRA are just a very, they're, yeah. I mean, I, I just can't say enough good things about them. The OIRA administrator is a Senate-confirmed position, so the president has to nominate someone, and then the Senate needs to confirm them, as you would a judge or, or a department head. Um, so he has announced his intention to nominate George Mason University law professor Naomi Rao, um, but her official nomination hasn't gone up, and, of course, she hasn't had her confirmation hearings and been confirmed yet. What's her bent? Um, she's um, a, an administrative law professor, um, very well respected. She runs a center at George Mason Law School. It's actually now called the Antonin Scalia Law School, called um, Center for Study of the Administrative State. Um, so she has a lot of experience, or she has a lot of academic knowledge. She also has worked in all three branches of government. She worked, um, she clerked for Justice Thomas in the Supreme Court. Um, she worked on the Hill and um, was in the White House Counsel's Office in the Bush administration. Interesting you, that you just uh, went to the Center for Administrative State. I was going to ask, Steve Bannon uh, <laughs> has talked about deconstruction of the administrative state. Is this what OIRA is going to be about? or They focus on the net benefits of the regulation. Will it how can we do how can we issue regulation that provides the most good for the cost so i think one thing that oira will be doing in this administration is providing that function so while they will definitely be needing to work with the agencies and they'll be coordinating this the 
um, regulatory offset and the two-for-one executive orders. Um, but I think they will be doing so in a way that recognizes which regulations continue to provide benefits and which ones perhaps have outlived their usefulness. The, um, and I think you called for this, and, and you said it, it hasn't really been calculated except maybe SBA. Should we have an accounting of the uh, actual total compliance costs, its impact on the economy every year? I actually think that's too hard to do. Okay. Um, in part because some of these costs are just too hard to measure. So the, people have called for a full regulatory budget that is equivalent to the fiscal budget, and it sure would be valuable to have. I just don't think it can be done in a way that is that is principled or would even be inform, as informative as, as the fiscal budget. Okay, last question as we get down. Um, how do we, do you feel that there's regulatory overreach that OIRA deals with that? And, and when there's a recommendation, for instance, to cut the EPA budget 30%, does somebody tie that back to how that would impact the reg, regs and rules right now that are in there? Well, that is one advantage of OIRA being part of the Office of Management and Budget, so mm-hmm. that there is some coordination across the budget side of OMB and the regulatory side. I can't say what role they had in, you know, whether how much OIRA is, was involved in that, in in that budget, those the skinny budget that has come out. Um, as you noted, there it's a very small staff. And they not only have regulatory responsibility, but the chief statistician of the United States is part of OIRA, so all the statistical information goes through that office. Wow. Um, so I don't know the extent that OIRA was involved in that. Well, it's been a fascinating uh, couple of segments, and you can see OIRA is actually a critical part of both the government and what looks like President Trump's uh, strategies on the administrative state, thanks to George Washington University Professor Susan Dudley. Her website is regulatorystudies.gwu and .edu, and Trump administration's regulatory actions can be found at reginfo.gov. That's R-E-G-I-N-F-O.gov. Thanks to Susan Dudley. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell.